All right, so we're going to go over the buried system, microtrack. Microtrack is two cables. It's called a leaky coaxial system, leaky coax. The idea there is that there are holes in the sensor braid. So if you have a coaxial system at your house, right, everybody plugs their TV into the coax. That braid is very tight. There's no holes in it. Well, with our microtrack, there's holes in those braids. And the holes are evenly spaced along the entire length of the braid. Okay, so there's no difference from our cable from the very beginning of the cable to the end of the cable. Whereas every other buried system on the marketplace that's leaky coax, they have cable segments. And nearest the processor, there's a tinfoil shield that wraps around that cable and has a very small opening in it. And the further you get from the processor, the wider that opening is. It's called a tapered foil. We don't do that. We use a evenly spaced ported coaxial system that leaks out RF energy. One cable is a transmit, one cable is a receive. What happens is those cables go in the ground. The transmit cable sensor sends out 64 frequencies down that transmit cable. They're all equally offset. Those frequencies are out into the air. On the receive side, it sees those frequencies and it sends back a combined signal to the processor. That combined signal creates its own specific frequency. And within the installation and software tool, you can see what that looks like. It looks like a sine wave in there. When you interact with the system, say somebody walks across it, the combined frequencies are unique at any point along that sensor cable. The accuracy is about six foot. Okay, so with our fence system, it's about 3.3 feet. With the buried system, it's about six feet. Okay, so when you interact with that sensor, when you start getting into that RF field, that combined frequency will change. And you can watch this happen. So if you're in the installation and service tool and you go to that screen and you look at that little sine wave, it just looks like a little sine wave on the screen. If you have someone go out and walk in that field and walk down the, down the, the sensor cables, you can see that sine wave shift. So it'll, the wave will actually get longer or more narrow. Okay, so you can see those things happening. This is repeatable, you can't fake it. And that's the basic operation of the microtrack system. When we're dealing with leaky coax, we're dealing with RF out in the air, right? RF doesn't just stop. It's impossible to send an RF signal and have it just stop right here. So if there's metal nearby, fences, razor coil, uh, metal pipes in the ground, wires in the ground, things like that, that RF signal will couple onto those things. And the amount of signal that couples onto those things can do some fun and unique and awesome things that just really give us headaches at the end of the day and make it difficult to troubleshoot. Um, or not. That's one of the great things about dealing with RF and leaky coax is each interaction with it is a little bit different. Each scenario where the cable crosses uh, uh, wires in the ground or pipes in the ground or where the cables uh, go near fences. They're all a little bit of a unique scenario and they each take a little bit of attention to get them figured out and get them nailed down. So with Microtrack, essentially you have a detection field that's about this size. This is a pretty accurate representation of the size of the primary detection field. What it doesn't show is all the dissipated, oh, all the dissipated RF energy that's still out there in the air, right? So if you set a Microtrack system up to detect a human walking through the zone, then you can adjust sensitivity to adjust the size of that detection area. But what that doesn't take into account is if you have a big, uh, say you have a semi-truck that drives by. That's a huge metal object that can reflect that RF energy back into the field. So um, y'all are lucky, you don't really have to deal with the buried system being too close to roadways. You usually have an inner fence and outer fence and the systems are between that, so you have some isolation there. But if you do have it where it's close to a roadway and you have big trucks going in, that could potentially be a source of issue for you. So if you're looking at designing these things, if you're looking at maybe making a change to your perimeter, maybe making a change to a parking lot or something interior, take those things into account. Um, so it's completely covert. You can't tell where it is if it's installed appropriately, if it's installed the right way. Usually, you know, you put it in the ground and then you put some rocks or something over the top of it and you smooth all that out. Uh, sometimes it goes into an area where there's no rock, so there's no gravel on top. And what can happen is the trenches can settle and you get these little depressions, okay? So if that's the case, then you can add more dirt back on top of that and tamp that down to completely cover it. What we don't wanna have happen is those uh, become open and either cable get exposed or water pool in those areas to have a large pool with surface area. Surface area 
is what will cause us nuisance alarms. Water can be on there. If there's gravel, if you put four or five inches of gravel on top and water is pooled underneath that gravel, as long as the surface area is broken, you won't have any issues at all with that water being on it. It's the surface tension. It's that large object that it appears to be when there's a pool of water on top of that can cause issues. That make sense? Questions on that? Concerns? Have you all experienced that? Yeah? This guy's like, no. This guy's like, yeah. This guy's like, So it does amplify the signal. The snow makes the field grow, right? So when we put snow on top of it, depending up into a certain depth. So what we found at our Canadian test site was that up until about four feet of deep of snow, the field grows. After four feet, it collapses. So while snow does make the field bigger, in high security applications where you're using a sensor like Microtrack, you clear the snow. Uh, so it can go in pretty much any material uh, besides just open water, um, clay, sand, other, whatever you've got. Uh, it calibrates very similarly to the way that the micropoint system calibrates. Each cell within the microtrack system responds to the material that it's installed in. So you have some areas that are, uh, have high impedance values. Those may have either a really high or really low sensitivity area. And if you just left the calibration at raw and didn't adjust anything, you may find that uh, your sensor field is either really big or really small in some areas. Once you've completed the calibration and you've adjusted your sensitivity to detect the person, you can expect a uniform sensitive field, okay? So about six to 10 inches on either side of the cable and about three to four feet high is, is typical. Have y'all experienced anything besides that? That's normal, okay. So uh, it, it connects into the software in the same way that the MicroPoint does. It looks almost the same. On the MicroNet 2, the MicroTrack 2, and the digital microwaves, we use what's called the universal installation and service tool. This is what I showed you with the MicroNet 2 system. It looks very similar, right? So we've got our tabs up at the top for each of the actions that we would use for troubleshooting, for tuning. And in this main screen, target location, we're showing a location of zero and working our way out in cells away from the processor. So this is showing one cable, length of that cable, and the magnitude of an event when you interact with that. I'm gonna push play. Nearly identical to the MicroTrack 1 system, when you walk down the cable, this blue line pops up. Now you'll see here there was a little bit of ghosting. You saw that second little event pop up down there. When you're dealing with RF signal, there's always gonna be some reflections. There's always gonna be some signal amplification and some null, and it's gonna respond that way. But you notice that it was so low in amplitude, it has no effect on the system. It's nothing to be concerned with. Um, Microtrack will calibrate to the soil. You'll notice that some areas are lower, some areas are higher. Now at our test site in Phoenix, it's all dry, it's all dirt. Uh, at our classroom, if you've ever come out to our factory and come to training in-house, you'll see that the system we use for training, half of it is in dry dirt with nothing covering it, and the other half of the system, we have three or four inches of a crushed rock. So it's like a half-inch crushed aggregate on top, of the, on top of the cables. And we do that so that one area can flood and pool. We can show what that looks like, and then that same puddle goes into the rocks, and you can see the difference there and how it responds. Out here, this is all just dry, flat area. It's kind of hard to see, but right out here, we've got a concrete pad. That concrete pad's got an asphalt on top of it. And you'll notice that corresponds really well to this little bump in the signal right here. It compensates for those things. The idea is that that RF signal, it's passing through those objects. And so when you walk across it, you interact with that sensor field in a certain way. It records what that is and then self-adjusts we call that sensitivity leveling. That's our buzzword for it, it's calibration. This is what you're gonna use for all of your system tuning, adjustment, calibration, um, setting up your, uh, what your sensitivity level is, all of those things. There's no more map. You're not gonna have a map around the perimeter. Every process you're gonna plug into is gonna look like this, okay? You'll have some settings, you'll have a cable A and a cable B, and then for those settings, each one will have tabs underneath. So instead of going to an engineering screen and having to open a PMI window and then going through certain steps to A to B to C, all those things, 
Now everything is it's much more simplified. The idea here was to make it easy, make it intuitive. So this is, this is what you're going to be working with. So you can see we've got our sensitivity set up, our calibration up here. Where you throw these uh, tumbleweeds on there, it can sense them, but no alarms from it because they create the, the events never passed that alarm threshold. Okay? We saw it, but we didn't have it set sensitive enough to alert from that. And that's the idea with the microtrack system is we want to be able to know when someone is close to the cables, but not alarm. When they pass through that zone, that's when we want to actually create the alerts. Right? So you can move around by it. The system will see you. That shows a little bit of how far away the, uh, that RF signal was dissipating on either side. But then when we actually walked through it, you saw the precise location of where that took place. Make sense? All right, so our general rules for the buried system. Uh, we like to see 30 feet of clear space. If at all possible, 30 foot clear space, nothing else in there. Absolutely clear, no cables, no wires, no sensors, no fences, no cars, no animals. You want a bunch of dogs running around the field, coyotes running around in there. Um, we want to make sure that their large metal objects are not in there. Uh, we don't want to put a bunch of, um, moving parts and pieces. When we're dealing with RF, you have to remember that any metal that touches other metal that's within that RF field will be a make or break connection. So as it heats up, that might move. If you think about chain link fence, for example, it's a wire that is zigzagged all the way down, right? It's wires that are connected like this, all the way up and down. Every point in time or every point in location on every one of those diamonds where those touch, that's a make or break connection. As it heats up and expands, they move around a little bit. As it cools and contracts, they move around a little bit. Every one of those can be a point of nuisance alarm when you're dealing with an RF field. All of them. I just want to emphasize that. Every place you have metal touching metal can be a make or break, can be a, new, a source for nuisance issues. So typically, uh, we will install it a processor. It'll have an A cable and a B cable. The A cables and B cables frequencies are two different frequency sets. They're designed to be offset so that you can tie those cables together. That way, you're not sending an A frequency all the way down the line to another processor. You have an A frequency that goes into a B side and a B frequency that goes into an A side, and they never interfere with each other. So we use inline termination kits for that. The inline termination kit simply ties the center conductors together and then it ties the braids together. All right, that's a, uh, sorry, that's a splice. We're gonna splice them that way. An inline termination will separate the center connectors, but tie the braids. And the idea there is that by tying the braids together, we allow that RF field to couple onto that other cable and then die out. And the field from the A side will couple onto that cable and then die out as well. So when we terminate this, we use ferrite beads. The ferrite beads collapse that RF field, and then the 51 ohm one watt resistor that's tied to the end of that that's what kills the signal. So it just kind of dies off into the open air. Does that make sense? Have questions on that? Due to the fact that the cable is the same, it's unique or uniform down the entire length of cable, if the cable's cut or damaged, you simply splice it back together in the same way that you would do an inline kit, right? So tie the center conductors together, tie the braids together, seal that up. We use what's called a potting compound, and our potting compound is two materials. It comes in one bag with like a little, uh, little separator. You squeeze that bag and those mix. Mix them up real good and then fill up the end line termination kit or the end of line termination kit and you fill that. And that fluid becomes uh, almost like a very firm jello inside that. And what happens is it completely seals it from the outside elements. So if you have freezing, thawing, wet, dry, those uh, connections inside there will never corrode. Make sense? So just some general practices. Like I said, we want to have the sensor cables buried in the ground with a little bit of material over the top of it so that water will separate to the sides. You don't want it pooling on top. If it is in an area where it pools on top, then we want to see some gravel or something up on top of there. We want to displace that surface area. You can have a big puddle of water and no alarms. It won't affect the system at all. 
But if the wind blows and there's a little bit of ripple on the top of that, or if birds land in there and there's a little bit of splash on top of that, that looks like a huge object because of that huge surface area. But by putting the gravel on there, by breaking that up, we eliminate any of those issues. When you're dealing with MicroTrack, um, depending on where the processors are and where the terminations are, it makes a difference when you talk about roadways. Because if you drive a very large vehicle over the cable near the processor, like, I, like you saw when we did the calibration, there's a little bit of ghosting. The same thing happens. There's reflections and there's ghosting down the line. So we always try to maneuver or, or shape where the processors go based on where those roadways are. We try to put the sensor cable nearest its termination when we pass the roadways or if we're going near anything where there's going to be really big vehicles. All right, so like I said, 30 feet is great. We like to see the sensor cables. The sensor cables can be anywhere from three feet to six feet apart. The wider the cables are, the wider your field is. And I always use a three to one ratio when I'm designing a system. If the cables are three feet apart, from the middle of that spacing, I want three times that distance to my nearest fence. So three foot here, I want three, six, nine feet to my nearest fence. And that's my absolute minimum on that. So if we're dealing with razor coil like you've got in the field, you've got a 30 foot clear space, I'm assuming your cables are probably three or four feet apart. So if we go from the center of that, four, eight, 12 feet, we'd like to see from the middle of that cable at least 12 feet to that razor coil. And you're probably close to within that range. Just like the bottom. Yeah, just like this guy. Yeah, that's pretty common. So just to show you some unique applications on the buried system, uh, this is an application at an airport. Uh, it runs through the grassway and then up, up across the tarmac in the same way that you all do it. They raise the cable up, they saw cut and laid it in there. Uh, and that determines, uh, they use video analytics to back that up. So when an airplane goes over, nothing happens. But when a person walks through there, there's an alert. Um, little hillside over here. This is extremely difficult, if at all possible. If you are designing anything, try to avoid hills. Hills and valleys are uh, big issues because of water runoff. Water is our worst enemy when we're talking about microwave or microtrack. Uh, 